This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Starters and puts, the cornerstone of any cuisine. Tonight, we'll explore scintillating starters to ignite learning and powerful puts that will leave a lasting impression at the end. So, whether it's for the starters or the puts, we're here for the ride. So, let's dive in. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Late Late Show. I'm Chris Wilkinson, your host for tonight, and I'm excited to dive into a topic that's essential for every teacher out there. So on tonight's show, we'll explore effective strategies for lesson starters and plenaries, two crucial components that can really set the tone for your teaching and enhance student engagement. Now, whether you're a seasoned teacher or just starting out, you know that we kick off a lesson can, and how we kick off a lesson can spark curiosity and interest. And equally important is how we wrap up things and ensuring that our students leave with a lasting impression and a clear understanding. So in my first half of tonight's show, I'll be discussing higher order thinking skills or HOTS and how I frame my questioning to foster deeper understanding. Plus, I'll share some creative and fun ways I introduce key terms using activities like crosswords, word searches, Pictionary, and even something from this morning, believe it or not. But that's not all. I'll also dive into some effective transitions into plenaries and explore how to use scenarios for applying skills and evaluating student understanding. I'm thrilled to share my insights with you tonight because it's it's to encourage people to think how can we apply these strategies into our own teaching practice so as we dive into our first segment tonight i just want to focus on higher order thinking skills or i call them hots now why i emphasize these skills in my teaching is because i use them for various reasons depending on where we are in the learning process so For context, I teach A-level and politics, and I'm going to highlight how it works for me, but, you know, just looking at it from a general point of view and generally how HOTS can work in any subject that you teach. So, for example, if we were teaching a new topic in, say, UK politics or even US politics, um, I use HOTS to activate prior learning and gauge my students' understanding of a subject. It helps me understand where they are what they already know, and how I can build on that foundation. So, for instance, you know, when introducing a topic like the UK parliamentary system, I might ask students, um, you know, questions that require them to think, you know, what do they already know about the political system and, you know, considering new concepts that we'll be discussing. So not only does this engage them, but it also allows me to tailor my teaching to their needs so for example by now my students you know if we're talking real time my students have learned democracy in the in in their politics lessons so they've learned about what democracy is the different types of democracy and um, the fact that you know there's pressure groups that can help or hinder democracy and so on and so forth so you know, if we were to look at the UK parliamentary system in a couple of months' time after Christmas, the first thing we need to look at is the fact that, you know, Parliament is drawn out from, you know, elected MPs who are, represent constituencies and so on. Now, they'll know that from what we've done already. So, you know, I can gauge their level of understanding and, you know, help, you know, embed what we already know and interleave from where we are with things like you know questions such as um so how do you become an mp 
you know, what is when was, when was the last time we saw MPs being elected? And of course, that will take them back to July. So, you know, they, they already know this, and you know, it would be an absolute. It, it would be it would be a travesty if I wasn't using their prior knowledge to help with the current knowledge as well. So, and you know, it also gives everyone a little bit of a confidence boost, knowing that they're not coming in raw. They've got something they know already, and it's going to help them. And likewise, if we're later in the week and revising, um, or rather revisiting a topic that we've we've covered before, I tend to use utilize hot to consolidate knowledge as well. So this reinforces their learning, encourages them to think critically about the material. So you know. For my A-level students, my second years, we'll we'll cover in feminism in a minute. So um, after discussing the various types of feminism, which we've done, um, tomorrow's our last session, with it being Friday, of course. Um, If you're listening live, it's obviously Friday tomorrow. Um, But, you know, we I will offer I will ask them questions that they've learned this week to to you know consolidate their knowledge. But you know, I might pose these questions in a way that challenges them to evaluate different perspectives or analyze the implications of you know perhaps real life situations so it not only does it deepen their understanding but helps them to apply what they've learned to a real world context and for politics students that's always so important because we need students to understand that what Simone de Beauvoir was saying in you know 19 in the 1900s is still applicable today but just in a real world setting. We did a really good session on that today and, and, and a hot session really helped with that. A hot, hot question really helped with that because we related what Simone de Beauvoir said early 20th, 20th century and we connected that with TikTok. So there was definitely real ways to do that. So for example, um, in a lesson that analyzes the difference between liberal and socialist feminists, um, or perhaps maybe equality and different feminists, I might ask the question, where will men be in the in this conversation? Where will men be welcomed into the conversation to help against the fight against patriarchy? Now, what a what a brilliant question that is, by the way. And I'm not taking credit for this question. That's why I'm saying it's a brilliant question, because uh, you know I, I took this for, with collaboration from 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 teachers that I've worked with before with this. But what a brilliant question that is. So I'll just pose it to you again. Where will men be welcomed into the, you know, where, sorry, where will men be welcomed to help with the fight against patriarchy? Now, you know, not once do we mention liberal, socialist feminists, or even difference feminists, or radical feminists, or third way, first way. You know, none of these, none of these are being mentioned in that question yet. It invites everyone to answer and have a go at that question, whether it's your A grade students who will dive straight in, talk about, you know, Sheila Rowbotham as a socialist feminist or or whatever, or someone who's maybe not quite there yet, who can still engage by saying, well, liberals want equality and they're welcomed in the conversation and they can work from it. So it's a really good thing. Now, I did this with my year 12s, bearing in mind that my year 12s are quite new to, to all of this. And, and and I said to them yesterday, I posed a question that said, what, which right has greater priority in the UK, a collective right or an individual right? Now, I actually hadn't taught them that yet. But I had taught them about the European Convention on Human Rights, the Human Rights Act, all these different varieties of rights that are available to us. And they were able to understand that these were attributed to individual and collective. And, you know, that question's asking two things, isn't it? Do you understand what collective and individual rights is? If not, you stick with that and have a go. You can't progress past level one if you don't if you don't know that. Your job today then, or for this part of this question, is to work out what you think that is. For the more advanced, again, it's adaptable for the higher learners. This then question... This, this this then asks them a different question, doesn't it? And it says, rather than, you know, do you know the difference between collective and individual? It's, okay, now you know that. Which one has greater priority? And why? Can you give an example? And you can just go on and on and on. Just with that one question, 
and it's so inclusive and it's absolutely brilliant and absolutely everybody can get involved and that's that's entirely what this thing's the you know this thing of teaching is all about isn't it um so let's talk about some effective hot techniques that i found particularly beneficial in the classroom so I've talked about open-ended questions that require students to explain their reasoning or justify their opinions. And I'll give you another example of this in law as well. Um, Because I teach A-level law as well. Um, I could ask them a question such as, how, or sorry, what is the role of the defendant in civil litigation? Okay. Now, I am going to get on to keywords in a moment. So later on, you're going to see how they already know the word litigation because we've done a whole um, starter on on keywords as well. But if let's just assume they've known that now. And this is a recap question. So this is a way for them to utilize their knowledge. So I'm saying to them, what is the role of the defendant in civil litigation? Now, that is an RA question. It's sort of it, it'll get most people on in, in, on board, and it'll get people thinking and and whatever else as well. But I actually think there's a better way of asking that question, and I actually think there's um, a way that this question can be worded once again, so that we can invite a variety of different answers at different levels, where we can invite this adaptability in the teaching. So instead of saying what is the role of the defendant in civil litigation, I'm going to ask this instead. How important is a cooperative defendant to the civil process? So I'll give you a bit of a spoiler alert for those who don't, you know, don't study law or don't understand law in in, in this context. Um, Basically, if you have a a cooperative defendant, it saves time and money. It means the trial process doesn't have to go ahead. It means the claimant gets what they want. It means a cooperative, all these different things coming out. And really... If the defendant is cooperative, they might make an an out-of-court settlement. They might admit liability early. They might even go some way to to make a reasonable offer. Now, these are three roles that they need to know, but that naturally or organically gets them to think about that, just the way in which the question is worded. So open-ended questions is really good. Now, finally, another effective technique, and this is the final higher-order thinking skill technique that I want to address tonight is the use of case studies or current events as prompts for discussion. So when we analyze events like the the US presidential elections, I encourage students to evaluate the different strategies that candidates use and impact on voter engagement. So we haven't even studied US politics yet because we're not there in the the, the curriculum, but um, I can guarantee that if, if I was to offer them you know, if we were to start it today, I could offer them a question that could totally get them going with this. So it could just simply be, um, you know, who is winning the election so far, do you think? And naturally, those who support Kamala Harris will come out in support of her. Those who are more prone to Trump will support him. But, you know, and that on its own isn't going to offer much, but it's getting them talking. And then I can, you know, start to ease in some some structure to that, whether it be looking at the role of the constitution, looking at keywords like, you know, electoral college or whatever. I can naturally bring that in, but they've started the conversation or they've they're directing the conversation and I, I can pick it up as we go, which is good. So using keywords, uh, so using case studies is a really good thing to then integrate keywords and, and other things in as well. So I encourage students to evaluate the different strategies um, for that reason. But not only does it connect to the um, classroom learning, but it also fosters this dynamic learning environment where they're taking responsibility for their learning. And lastly, considering incorporating collaborative activities as well with them case studies is really important as well. So, you know, it could be that, we look at how the lessons have transformed, you know, over time. So we could start off with looking at, you know, one small point, but then really, you know, snowball on that into something much more transformative towards the end of the week. And again, this really helps to engage with the material and it encourages this culture of inquiry, critical thinking and essential skills for the future studies and careers. Now, for law, this is really simple because whenever we do anything on, um, you know, we, we could be doing things on, the criminal process, we could be doing things on, uh, you know, sentence, anything like that. 
put the news on. There's always something going on. And unfortunately, a, a really good example that I've been using recently is the, the riots that we had in the summer and the close to very much close to where I live in Sunderland, there was a the, the riots made it onto the, the main news and we were able to to use the the riots where a lot of our students live and they can relate to it and we can relate that to some some key terminology and some um some key structures within the criminal process. And as tragic as it is to use that as an example, it's it's also, you know, it would be remiss of me not to, to go that way. So whether you're just starting a new topic or consolidating knowledge later in the week, I encourage you to embrace HOTS, higher order thinking skills, in your question strategies. It can be truly to it can it can truly enhance the learning experience and equip your students with the skills that they need to navigate the complex political landscapes or whatever key terms or key phrases that you need to your students to know. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Introducing Reading Solutions UK. Home to Dreambox Reading Plus, the online reading development programme improving outcomes for students and schools nationwide. Create stronger readers in your school from Key Stage 2 to beyond GCSE using Reading Plus's evidence-based adaptive technology. Reading Plus accurately assesses your students' skills gaps and places them on a personalised learning pathway. Built to accelerate their strengths, and improve on their areas for development. You can try the programme with a free four-week pilot today. Search Reading Solutions UK to find their website and request your free pilot today. How can you show your students the opportunities that await them? How can you fuel their aspirations and motivate them to achieve? Futurum Careers provides a wealth of stimulating resources aimed at encouraging 14 to 19 year olds to pursue careers in STEM and SHAPE. We help you to show your students what they can aim for and how. From articles to activity sheets, animations to podcasts, all our resources align with Gatsby benchmarks and are free for you and your students to download. Visit futurumcareers.com and subscribe today. Futurum Careers helping teachers to inspire the next generation. Get set for the year ahead with the Bloomsbury Education Back to School Sale. Save 30% on all Bloomsbury Education books until 30th September. From the very best in research-led practice to trusted advice on inclusivity, behaviour and curriculum design, we've got something for everyone. Visit bloomsbury.com forward slash B2S sale to shop now and save 30%. Bloomsbury Education, books for every step of your teaching journey. Teachers, mark your calendars for BET UK 2025, the world's biggest edtech event. Join over 30,000 educators at the Excel London from the 22nd to the 24th of January. Discover the latest edtech innovations, network with peers and access hundreds of hours of CPD. Did we mention it's 100% free for educators? Whether you're looking for inspiration or practical tools to enhance your teaching, BET has it all. Don't miss this opportunity to shape the future of education. Register today at uk.betshow.com. That's uk.betshow.com. This is Teachers Talk Radio. And this is Teachers Talk Radio News. Well, welcome back, everyone, and this is The Late Late Show with me, Chris Wilkinson. Now, let's dive into some creative activities introducing key terms that are unique to the topics that we cover. So we're still on the topic of star starters, and we will do for, the, for this half of the, the show. Um, and, you know, as well as the high water thinking skills and as well as other activities that you could look at around this, such as case studies, I just want to dive into some really important points such as key terms and how we would use key terms to that are unique in, in, in the topics that we cover. Now, these activities are not only 
they're here to make learning fun, but also to help reinforce understanding of crucial vocabulary that students just simply need to grasp in order to 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 achieve. And whether this be at GCC, whether this be at um, you know primary school, or in my case at A level, these concepts are what they need to carry in their toolbox all year, and they. Um, it needs to be there all year that they can pull out their pencil case and just use as and when is necessary. And so how do we do that? How do I do that at A level? Well, one of my favorite tools is the crossword puzzle. And, you know, I often create crosswords that incorporate these key terms from the unit we're studying. So, for instance, if we're looking at the concept of democracy, I'll include words like participation, referendum, electoral system. and not only does this engage students in a different way, but also helps them familiarize themselves with terminology through context. So as they fill in their crossword, they're essentially recalling definitions and relationship between terms, reinforcing their understanding in an enjoyable format. This works perfectly in law too. And where we look at keywords in the civil and criminal process. Now, for example, in law, we must know the difference between prosecute, charge, convict, and arrest. Because if we're talking about a judge sentencing someone, we can't say that they've been sentenced because they've been prosecuted, because that prosecute means when they go to trial. And it does charging doesn't mean prosecuting. That's something earlier in the process. And arrest is even earlier in the process. So we need to untangle these words get them to use them differently and it's already October and I'm pleased to say that majority of my students are doing that whether they can re recall this by January February times a different issue which is again why my crosswords come in is a really helpful meaningful tool to to help them remember how these words are put in, in the process and I'll often use a word search as well and I find that word searches are really good if you say got a, a class say first thing on a morning Monday morning give them a word search crosswords can be a little bit too much for them to start with and I know we should be we should be getting them cooking from the moment they come in but we are we are still you know we are still getting them cooking we are still you know utilizing every minute but the word search it offers a slightly different purpose. It's great for recognition and it's great for, uh, you know, and I'll design word searches featuring key terms that they need to know for, for that week in the upcoming assessment, but I'll do it in a way where sometimes they'll be backwards and they'll be diagonal and they really have to think about it. And it often takes someone to say, no, no, it's there. Where? I can't see that. And eventually they do. And, you know, it's a, it's a great way to get them thinking. And as they search for the words, like I said, I encourage them to, to say it out loud and perhaps even share a brief definition with their partner. And this active involvement does help solidify their memory of the key terms while adding an element of teamwork and collaboration, which is what it's all about. Now, another key engaging method I use is something that, that, that I got from this morning. So if you've ever watched this morning, if I appreciate as teachers, we don't often get, we don't often get to do that, but say you've had a sick day and you, you, you know, you've got your, you sitting on the, on the couch with your lem sip or um, your chicken soup, you might, you, you might have actually saw a bit of this morning and <clears throat> It's a, it was a game called You Say We Pay, and I, I don't know if they still do it. I haven't watched this in the morning for years, but Richard and Judy used to do it. It was great. And it was, you know, this game was inspired by a segment that I came across when they would, you know, when I was watching it one time, probably when I wasn't very well, lying on the couch. But it's become a class favourite. And, you know, in this game, students provide clues relating to a specific key term, but they give that clue to me. So I've got my back to the board and the keywords on the wall on the board and they have to tell me what that word is and you know for example if they were to say this system allows citizens to vote directly on legislation then the correct response would be referendum but of course they may not articulate it that way they may say something like um we did it in 2016 and we voted brexit and i'll go oh okay referendum or they might say um you know, I'm trying to think, bus, um, big red bus said 
we're going to give money to the NHS instead of Brexit. Oh, okay, referendum or something. Um, and, you know, to make it even more interactive, I, I divide the class into teams and for them to say, you say, we pay. So I'll think of the questions or the key terms in advance and they have to guess it. But if they're guessing it, they even have time to think of the keywords and the question, you know, and everything. So it's really good. And, um, you know, we can keep the score based on how quickly they guess the words. And not only do this add an element of friendly competition, um, which is always, always um really handy to have um it also encourages them to think critically about the clues and how they relate to political concepts and it is low stakes but it comes with big awards sometimes chocolates if if the uh, if if the awards are um you know towards the end of the year and it's crucial to highlight that these key terms are not just for fun like i said these play a significant role in student answers and they'll often appear in exam questions. So if a history student is to is asked to discuss the causes of World War One, for example, they or if the lesson's around that, they might start the lesson by looking at words like imperialism, nationalism to to articulate their responses. Um I'm conscious that we have a few history teachers listening, so I hope that I've got that right. Um but in geography we we might discuss climate change. So students might be expected to reference terms like greenhouse gases or sustainability. And familiarity with these terms can significantly enhance their answers and ultimately improve their exam performance. And these activities are beneficial for several reasons. They promote active engagement, participation, like we said, but helps them have a deep understanding of the key terms. It also caters to their different learning styles, so making it easier for um, sorry, their learning preferences, I should say making it easier for everyone to connect with the material that is um that resonates with them but finally it also makes the practice of vocabulary enjoyable and we can re reduce that anxiety that comes with learning new materials especially if a student is doing a subject as intricate as politics and it is crucial in creating a positive learning environment where students feel confident to explore and articulate their ideas. And these terms will be vital not only in their classroom discussions, but also as they prepare for university and the high, any, any other further education that they have. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at uh, we're going to sort of move on to the PUD section now and look at how we can, you know, transition from the main activity into the the plenary and looking at how plenaries can really help, you know, leave a lasting impression. So while the so so while the starters bring the action, the PUDs are always there to, to make sure that the action remains in their work and memory. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Are you a teacher who has concerns about your students' low reading levels? Are you also worried disadvantaged students won't be able to catch up? The online reading development programme, Dreambox Reading Plus, adapts to a student's skill level, accelerates reading progress and helps students acquire a wide vocabulary. The patented technology develops reading fluency and supports the transition to increased text complexity from Key Stage 2 to Key Stage 3 and 4, where language and vocabulary are more challenging. You can try the programme with a free four-week pilot today. Search Reading Solutions UK to find their website and request your free pilot. How do we stop teachers marking books on their kitchen table on a Sunday night? instead of wanting to spend time with their family. Is live marking truly cutting edge practice? What if I told you that I could provide evidence of verbal feedback and its impact on student outcomes? Now traditional marking 
time and time again is reported as the number one reason why teachers leave the profession. It trumps behaviour issues and teacher salary. In Guide to Feedback, I share nine case study skills that demonstrate nine different ways to provide marketing feedback, all evidenced by student outcomes. Now, not every school will be ready for this, but hopefully you are ready to start your feed up and feed forward journey. The Teacher Toolkit Guide to Feedback is out now and you can get an exclusive 30% discount when you order Teacher Toolkit Guide to Feedback from Bloomsbury.com. Just use the code TTRGTF at the checkout. That's TTRGTF and it expires 30th of November. Happy reading. Do you ever wish you could sit down with other teachers and delve into the challenges and opportunities we face? Well, that's exactly what Table Talks at Bet UK is all about. Join small roundtable discussions based on your selected topics to share insights, learn from peers and tackle the big issues in education, all in a sponsor-free environment. This is your chance to connect and collaborate like never before. Be part of the conversation at BET UK in January 2025. Visit uk.betshow.com to learn more. This is Teachers Talk Radio. And this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The Teacher Tap blog has published its latest update. Recent questions have focused on teachers' overall satisfaction with work at this point in the term and year. A recent question about what can cause stress for teachers suggests that student behaviour is top of the charts followed by admin tasks and pastoral concerns for pupils. Senior school staff, however, were more likely to focus on pastoral concerns, followed by relationships with parents and then accountability. Middle leaders feel the most stress over admin tasks. Teacher satisfaction is a key focus in any discussion on retention and recruitment. And it's recruitment that government have focused on with their latest announcement on bursaries for new teachers entering the profession. A Department for Education update published on the government website contains details for the 2025 to 2026 academic year. Bursaries in some science subjects, maths and computing, are £29,000. £10,000 is available for trainees in art and design, music and RE, with English trainees qualifying for £5,000. Bursaries for undergraduates studying for a course including QTS in some sciences, maths, computing or languages are also on offer. Full details can be found on the .gov.uk website. For support staff, legislation to reinstate their negotiating body, the SSSNB, was introduced in Parliament via the Employment Rights Bill. With many schools expressing concern over difficulties in recruiting key support staff, and those already employed concerned over low pay, this could be key. Schools Week covered the story saying it was part of attempts to establish national terms and conditions, fair pay and career progression routes. The changes will apply to maintain schools and academies. This currently do not have to follow national pay rules. The SSSNB was scrapped in 2010, but the Department for Education said the reintroduction of it makes a key milestone in its commitment to reset the relationship with the sector. The BBC reports that a science, technology, engineering and maths event on the Isle of Man has had to be postponed due to transport issues. The fourth annual STEM Fest, which sees all the island's primary children take part, has been due to take place on the 23rd and 24th of October. The Department for Education said the decision to push back the event was taken due to significant logistical challenges as a result of bus driver shortages. The STEM event was designed to spark interest in the field of science and technology and allow young people to explore potential careers. The DfE on the island felt it was better to postpone rather than exclude some school, but the decision was regrettable. Schools Week reports that the Department for Education has scrapped a scheme forcing schools to opt out of receiving the optional Key Stage 1 SATS papers, which cost an estimated £1.6 million last year. 
In 2023-24, the Standards and Testing Agency required schools to opt out of receiving the SATS materials, despite them being non-statutory. As fewer than 1 in 10 primaries opted out, the DfE estimated printing costs of £1.5 million. Teacher TAP survey results showed that 60% of primary teachers would continue with the key stage 1 SATs. However, the STA says the papers will no longer be reprinted, but made available for download instead. Schools can order hard copies of modified test papers. The Times featured the BBC Young Musician lineup, who it says shared two things in common, a talent for music and the fact that none of them attend a state school. The BBC competition has run for decades and is seen as a way to get young people more involved in classical music. This year there has been some criticism of the judging of the competition and the narrow selection of finalists in terms of the instrument specialisms. No woodwind, brass or percussion players. However, the editorial piece does focus more on the fact that all six finalists attend private or specialist music schools. The writer Richard Morrison goes on to describe state school music teaching as a postcode lottery. He goes on to highlight previous winners of the competition who have attended state schools, but points out that even learning an instrument can be costly and that this simply excludes many young people from developing a talent over the long term. There has been much debate over the importance of the arts in schools. The BBC Young Musician competition continues to add nuance to the debate about music. Finally, the TES reports on research by the Education Policy Institute that longer days improve students' grades. Sort of. The author of the study says it shows that pupils in schools with longer days perform better, but says further research is needed into how those hours are being spent. Schools are typically open for 190 days. Academies and free schools can be more flexible. In 2022, the previous government also laid out the expectation that all schools should deliver a school week of at least 32.5 hours. The EPI research found that in 2023 to 24, four in five primary schools and three in four secondaries met the 32.5 hour minimum. The research also shows that an additional hour of secondary school time each week is associated with a 0.17 grade improvement in one subject, whilst an additional hour in primary is associated with improvements in key stage two scale scores in maths and reading. This is consistent with international research which points to longer school weeks having modest effects on attainment. As with all research, there are plenty of caveats. Longer days does not necessarily mean longer lessons, nor what those lessons are or how balanced a curriculum might be. Past research says that additional hours have greatest effect when pupils are taught by their regular teacher. Being taught one-to-one -one or in a small group setting also helps. These are all costly for schools and indicative that more might only be better in certain circumstances. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. Thank you, Joe, and welcome back, everyone. I hope you found the news segment very insightful. I certainly did. Wasn't aware of the the the, the hours in terms of the um, you know in improving engagement, which is it's always interesting to know. And let's hope further research is done. And I hope that you're ready now to dive into the next topic in our segment, which is all about effectively transitioning from a main activity into a plenary. And in my lessons, it's a critical moment that for me reinforces learning and provides that level of closure for students before they grab their bags and, and leave for the door. Now, in my A-level politics sessions, transitioning smoothly is crucial because it allows students to reflect on what they've learned and articulate their understanding. However, the strategies I use can be applied across various subjects and whether you teach in English, geography, modern foreign languages, history, um, or any other discipline, it's all, it's, it's all relevant, it certainly is. Now, the one method I use and I would often use throughout the course of the week is a method that I'm sure we're all aware of, but it's I ask, we reflect, you share. 
And after completing a group activity where we discuss a political theory or a specific group, or if it's in law, it might be a concept such as, you know, um, prosecution or something, I take a moment to ask, scu- ask students a, a question that encourages them to reflect on what they've learned. So, for example, I might say to them, what is the most surprising thing you've learned about the electoral system today? And quite often they'll come back and say something like, oh, that you can only ever possibly have two winners in the general election because of the electoral system. And, you know, I'll then dig in and say, oh, why is that then? And they'll explain why, because, um, you know, tactical voting and whatever else as well. So after a brief pause for reflection, I then ask students to share their thoughts with the class. Um, so I'll, you know, I'll go around and speak to them, but then they'll share this as a group. Now, how they share this as a group, as a class, varies from student to student, and we are becoming more familiar with students who just simply don't want to share their ideas verbally. But you know, we give grab them a pen, throw them a whiteboard, not literally, of course, and um, you know, get them to 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 put plunk their ideas on there and share it that way. Um, or others may want to come up and write on the board, whatever, post it notes. Um, not only does this allow them to engage their understanding, but helps them to create a space for different perspectives to emerge. And often that will be the case. Now, it's also an excellent plenary at the end of the week. So um, this I, we, you is excellent. So typically students will have learned the content by the last session of the week um, for politics because I tend to do it so it's a, a topic a week. Sometimes that isn't the case, but they know in advance when that is but it's typically once a week. And, you know, in this time, they will use the IWU strategy. And it's slightly different for, for when we look at it towards exam practice, because what we'll do is we'll look at a, you know, we'll look at a particular topic. So let's say um, the policies of the Conservative Party. So I might say, um, so here's a 30 mark question for you. The quote is, um, so for a 30 mark question, you get given a quote and you've got to provide an argument for and against, but only really concluding one side. So the quote might say something like, the Conservative Party is virtually unrecognisable from the time of, insert Prime Minister from 100, 200 years ago. Um, and, you know, it's not easy for them to do that, of course, but it's easier if we would use the I, we, you model. So what I'll do is I'll provide them with a model to begin with. So I'll say, okay, let me let me do the perfect paragraph for you. So um, we'll include what we normally do, point, you know, point, explain, um, evidence, evaluate, and so on. You know, you know the, the whole Peel method. Um, so we'll do that together. And then what we'll say is, right, why don't we do it as a group? So as a pair or a three, why don't you come up with one together? And then finally, we reduce it to one. So we start with everyone, we reduce it down to pairs and threes, then we boil it down to one. And that one paragraph that they have to do on their own, or that one point they have to do on their own, this is only really helped or aided by the modeling that either I've shown or what the her, their fellow colleagues or their fellow um, peers have shown. And um, it's a scaffolding technique, but ultimately it leaves them with three points, which is really, really important. So I find it absolutely vital for what we're doing. Another strategy I frequently employ is the exit ticket method. Now, at the end of the lesson, I ask students to write down one thing they've learned, one question they still have in one application in one application what they've learned to a real world situation so for law and politics this is you know it's always relevant so for instance we might look at something that is completely you wouldn't expect it at all be relevant to, to real world or they certainly wouldn't um judicial independence let's just say so a question you still have so it might be something like what cases will we learn for this if we haven't done that yet? Um, how might you see this concept in action in our society? Um, and what you know, what have we covered within the judicial independence? So no one key words, but but that bit about you know um, what you know how might you see this concept in action in society today? 
that's really difficult. And um, it's a question that might never be asked. And it's a shame that it's not because that's the only way. I mean, they can recite a key word, students at A-level. But do they understand why that's relevant to today? Why are we doing it? Why is it contemporary with what we're doing? And, um, you know, that's the bit that might take a bit long, long time um, to do. And I don't mean getting the answer right, but it might get used to thinking, right, we're going to, by the end of today, you're going to be able to tell me how this is relevant to society. Now, how is judicial independence important in society today? Um, well, for all sorts of reasons. Now, going back to that original point I said at the top of the, the episode about the Sunderland riots, it could be relevant here. Um, you know, if judges have to, say, provide a two-year sentence for anybody who's who's, done, who's been involved with the riot, then they have to be independent from thought and, and, and do what they have to do. And it's relevant to, to, to that. So that, that's a good example. But we also think of other reasons as well. Um, and it consolidates their learning and provides me with valuable feedback and how we can use that for future lessons as well. And peer teaching is another powerful approach I, I love to incorporate. So after a main activity, I might ask a few students to summarize key concepts and explain them to their peers. So for instance, if we've just analyzed the impact of say social media on political campaigns, I could say, now I'd like a couple of you to explain for example, I don't know what we discussed about how that impacts social media um, and how it influ influences voting behavior. So this could reinforce their understanding of young people are targeted by TikTok, talk, TikTok, older people are targeted by newspapers, and it builds their confidence in articulating their ideas. And I like to use graphic organizers, organizers to help with this as well. So after a discussion or activity, I might introduce a concept map. So, for example, exploring the different political ideologies, I would say, let's create a concept map that doesn't just connect liberalism, socialism, but connects liberalism and socialism to feminism and, you know, liberal feminists and socialist feminists. So it's, it's combining the two. So what are the key ideas we need to include? This approach not only helps to synthesize their learning, but also clarifies how different, um, you know, how different the concepts interconnect as well. So while these activities are tailored to my politics sessions, they can easily be adapted for other subjects as well. So for instance, in English, I might ask you, or we might ask students to summarize a character's motivation and then share these insights with the class. In geography, I might ask, what is one human impact on the environment we've discussed today? In foreign languages, it might be, um, I could ask students to explain vocabulary or words or grammar points to another. But the key, to a successful transition, I find, is ensuring that students are actively engaging and reflecting on their learning before moving into the plenary. This not only solidifies their understanding, but it fosters a sense of community in the classroom where everyone feels their contributions are valued. And you can do this with some really simple techniques. It might just be before moving on to the plenary, just making sure that they're all with you. Um, Give, give us a key word, give us a key term that you've learned so far, right? And then if they all come up with the same word, we're going to use that word as part of the plenary. So whether you transition into a plenary in politics, English, geography, or any other subject, incorporating strategies like I, we, you, exit tickets, ugh, easy for me to say, exit tickets, again, peer teaching, graphic organizers, um, they can help enhance the effectiveness of your plenary sessions. It is also about creating those moments of reflection that help students synthesize their learning and prepare them for what's next. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Introducing Reading Solutions UK. Home to Dreambox Reading Plus, the online reading development program improving outcomes for students and schools nationwide. Create stronger readers in your school from Key Stage 2 to beyond GCSE using Reading Plus's evidence-based adaptive technology. 
Reading Plus accurately assesses your students' skills gaps and places them on a personalized learning pathway, built to accelerate their strengths and improve on their areas for development. You can try the program with a free four-week pilot today. Search Reading Solutions UK to find their website and request your free pilot today. How can you show your students the opportunities that await them? How can you fuel their aspirations and motivate them to achieve? Future and Careers provides a wealth of stimulating resources aimed at encouraging 14 to 19 year olds to pursue careers in STEM and SHAPE. We help you to show your students what they can aim for and how, from articles to activity sheets, animations to podcasts. All our resources align with Gatsby benchmarks and are free for you and your students to download. Visit futurumcareers.com and subscribe today. Futurum Careers, helping teachers to inspire the next generation. Get set for the year ahead with the Bloomsbury Education Back to School Sale. Save 30% on all Bloomsbury education books until 30th September. From the very best in research-led practice to trusted advice on inclusivity, behaviour and curriculum design, we've got something for everyone. Visit bloomsbury.com forward slash B2S sale to shop now and save 30%. Bloomsbury Education. Books for every step of your teaching journey. Teachers, mark your calendars for BET UK 2025, the world's biggest edtech event. Join over 30,000 educators at the Excel London from the 22nd to the 24th of January. Discover the latest edtech innovations, network with peers and access hundreds of hours of CPD. Did we mention it's 100% free for educators? Whether you're looking for inspiration or practical tools to enhance your teaching, BET has it all. Don't miss this opportunity to shape the future of education. Register today at uk.betshow.com. Welcome back once again to the Late Late Show with me, Chris Wilkinson, to our final segment for tonight's Late Late Show. And I'd like you to take I like to take this final piece as an opportunity to focus on how we can use scenarios to enhance students' applications, skills, and evaluation abilities based on the content that they've learned. I appreciate this is um, very much for my subject, but I know after having conversations with fellow teachers in, in my college that this is certainly something that is very, very crucial in most subjects. And, um, you know, I often find that students can benefit from engaging with real world scenarios that allow them to apply their knowledge that they've gained in a practical context. So, for example, after studying the UK's parliamentary system, I might present a scenario where students have to evaluate a current political issue, but it will be relevant to them. So it will be a very much a 16-year-old issue, um, maybe bus, bus issues, bus strikes, transport, something like that. And, you know, getting them to, to think about how this proposed piece of legislation uh, or this recent political event would be relevant to what they've learned, but also relevant to them too. And not only does it encourage them to think critically about the material, but it allows them to synthesize their learning. I might ask questions like, how would this legislation impact the political landscape in the UK for 16 year olds? Or what are the potential consequences for various stakeholders? And these questions prompt students to use their prior knowledge to analyze the situation from multiple perspectives. And it doesn't require a huge, a lot of detail it, it, it is enough for them to, to have this conversation and it might be part of the exit ticket but either way these scenarios are great for them to reinforce what they've learned now in english classes for example teachers might use scenarios relating to the themes of a novel so students could be asked to analyze a character's decision in a specific situation prompting them to draw on a textual evidence uh you know and their understanding of character development so getting a character and put them into another scenario that they've made up and how would they respond to that and that might help them understand their characters for geography it could be involving real world environmental situations um students might evaluate the effectiveness of different strategies for addressing for, for addressing climate change in a specific region and by discussing scenarios like these they can apply geographical theories and concepts to current events 
in modern foreign languages, scenario-based activities are very effective. So students could play a role play where they negotiate a deal or they go, you know, we've seen it where they go to go into a shop or they um, they try to get into a bus or, or something where they're discussing the cultural differences in a specific situation. And again, this reinforces their language skills and also requires them to think critically about communication and cultural nuances, mirroring the evaluative processes that we use in you know, my subject, politics, but foreign languages, English, whatever. So how can you implement these scenario-based scenarios in your classroom? Well, here's what I do. So I might create a realistic scenario, again, crafting a scenario that's relevant to the content. So we can use current events, historical events if it's relevant, hypothetical situations that require critical thinking. I do a lot of this in law. So learn a law, apply the law. Encourage group work. So divide them into small groups and get them to think of a scenario. So, you know, that, that goes right to the top of the, um, you know, uh, of the, um, of, of, of what we need to know and to, uh, you know, what students need to know. And, and it really helps with their um, skills to, 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 to create, drives their knowledge right up, doesn't it? Um, and it promotes collaboration and multiple viewpoints, which is always important for politics. I'm sure it is for other subjects as well, but multiple viewpoints. And group discussions can help students articulate their ideas. It can, it can help them get into an argument as well, by the way, which um, we have to control, but certainly that's not the point of it. Um, role play is good, like we said, but this one as well, intricate reflection really good okay so after completing scenario based activities have students reflect on their learning they can write a short summary on their thoughts or discuss what they've learned about the topic and their analytical skills they practice so let me share one final example with you before we we leave it um recently we explored the implications of the recent general election in the uk so i divided the groups into um twos and threes and we assigned it each group a different political party and they had to evaluate how the party's proposed policies would impact various demographics not least themselves and present their findings now this exercise not only required them to analyze the policies critically but also to consider the broader societal implications of a political decision by the way they did this in 10 minutes it was literally 10 minutes so hop on Right, what have you got? Okay, you've got the Labour Party. You tell me, you've got the, some of the policies. Tell me how that affected your demographic. Okay, um, how did the Lib Dem policies affect another demographic, uh, you know, the elderly, the, the disabled, something like that? And it was really good. 10 minutes is all it took. And it enhanced the um, analytical skills. And it just really, again, connected classroom learning to the real world so i took them out the politics classroom put them in the real world which makes it more meaningful and much more memorable so in summary i think integrating scenarios into your lessons is an effective strategy to enhance application skills and evaluation but encouraging students to engage with real world situations it's a 10 minute job not even that which and then 10 minutes it can further help develop critical skills rather than just get them to recap and relearn what they've done put it into action and these transferable skills are absolutely um transferable not just across different skills such as uh, you know application evaluation but it's across different disciplines from politics english geography modern languages as well and with that in mind i would just like to finish off by saying that my plenaries like starters can be no more than 10 minutes and all of this is manageable within that time if you are able to in advance know precisely what it is that you want from your learners and of course over time i'm only in october at this point by february i will know precisely how to make them 10 minutes much more effective than perhaps the 10 minutes we're in now but it's a journey and we all have to do it together.
So unfortunately, that brings the end of today's episode. And I would like to thank you all for, for tuning in and being part of the conversation just by listening. I hope you found these strategies useful and feel motivated to integrate a scenario-based learning into your lessons, to look at the starters such as higher order thinking skills and how to adopt key terms into your strategies as well. And really just help doing whatever it is to nurture a passion for learning and critical thinking in our classrooms. And thank you once again for, for listening and being part of this conversation and being the best teachers that you can be. So until next time, please take care and keep inspiring your students to be the best that they can be. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.